About a month ago, the sequel to Deadly Premonition released for the Switch. I haven't played it yet, but the fact that this sequel exists is a testament to the enduring cult success of a game that is objectively bad in so many ways, and yet is still a compelling and fascinating experience even 10 years after its release. Deadly Premonition originally released for the Xbox 360 in 2010, and featured an FBI detective travelling to a small American town to solve a murder. While there, he encountered a series of increasingly bizarre characters in a scenario that David Lynch would be proud of. It was also incredibly budget in its presentation. It was clunky, full of weird frame drops, featured uncomfortable facial animations, and had all the hallmarks of being the vision of a Japanese man with limited understanding of America setting a game in small town America. And yet, people loved it, and I include myself in that group. But why did a game so inherently broken and downright weird gain so much love to the point of gaining a sequel 10 years later? Today, friends, we'll be looking at why Deadly Premonition is so bad it's rad. The protagonist of Deadly Premonition is FBI Special Agent Francis York Morgan. Please, just call me York. That's what everyone calls me. Okay, I will. And he is a quirky chap. He is utterly fascinated with everything he encounters and retreats into a mind palace where he pieces clues together on a slideshow he calls profiling, despite profiling being a specific investigative technique and not literally the entire investigation. He also exhibits a number of unusual traits you wouldn't normally expect of a serious federal agent, such as speaking to a mysterious unseen figure called Zack, or divining information from coffee swirls. Did you see that, Zack? Clear as a crisp spring morning. F. K. In. The coffee. I knew I could count on it. Never fails. Our first introduction to York is when he's driving into Greendale in a manner that's both distracting and probably hilariously illegal. He's on his laptop, he's smoking, he's on the phone having a super serious conversation with someone about the codependency of Tom and Jerry. It's perhaps inevitable that he crashes, but this doesn't faze him. York is a suave and unflappable investigator ready for action and won't stop until he gets his suspect. He's also a massive nerd, in case the Tom and Jerry conversation wasn't enough of an indication of that. I mean, really, focusing that much attention on pop culture and examining it in ludicrous detail? Who does that? Oh yeah, me. That's who does that. During your time playing as York, he will often spend long drives around the town talking to his invisible friend Zack about movies, mostly the greats from the 80s. It's endearing and it's oddly relaxing to listen to and one of the many qualities that make York a joy to spend time around. And when you have a protagonist this endearingly weird, then you want to spend time with him. So even if you've never played Deadly Premonition before, you may think the scenario sounds a little familiar. A quirky FBI agent investigating a murder in a small town filled with oddballs in a story that becomes just as much about the town as it does about the murder. You may have heard it before. And that's because you may have seen Twin Peaks, David Lynch's beloved classic TV show about a quirky FBI agent investigating a possibly supernatural murder in a small town filled with oddballs. Both York and Carl McLachlan's Dale Cooper in the series are a little odd, with traits that mirror each other quite closely. While York is talking to someone called Zack, Cooper is leaving messages on our tape recorder for someone called Diane. While York is divining initials from coffee, Cooper is getting very excited about drinking some damn fine coffee. And both of them frequently dream about a red place occupied by small people who talk in riddles. This Twin Peaks connection was originally much greater. Back when the game first debuted as Rainy Woods, the similarities were even more blatant, to the point where CBS were keen to put a stop to it. But it extends to other aspects of the game. A character turns out to be trans, mirroring the presence of Denise Bryson in Twin Peaks, although Swery 65's handling of trans issues is notably clumsier than Lynch's. And Lynch's log lady, a mysterious figure who always carries a log everywhere she goes, is replaced with the pot lady who is always holding a pot and is worried it'll get cold before she gets where she needs to go. Other quirky characters who wouldn't seem out of place in Twin Peaks include the gas station couple who either only talk when offered bribes or attempt to seduce York respectively, rich man Mr. Stewart whose illnesses lead him to wear a terrifying gas mask and speaking through his assistant Michael, who only communicates in rhyme. And then there's Polly, the old lady who runs a massive hotel entirely by herself, but insists on sitting miles away from her guests over breakfast. Just like Twin Peaks, every character is charming in their weirdness, and it goes a long way to making the game so interesting. Usually if a game is poorly made, it'll feel sparse, 
and rushed. Truly awful games can sometimes feel like assets thrown together without rhyme or reason and thrown out into the world hoping someone will buy them. Or perhaps tricking people into buy them if we're being less charitable. Deadly Premonition, for all its low budget glory, never feels like this. It's packed with details and the sheer amount of mechanics thrown in to increase immersion is crazy. The game has survival mechanics with tiredness and hunger measured by meters, and a better balance than most actual survival games, as York can go for much of the day without sleep. You know, like an actual person in real life can do. But that's not all. York can shave, and if you choose not to, there is actual beard growth. You can change between multiple suits, and are actively encouraged to because wearing the same suit for too long makes York attract flies. When you jump in a car, you have full control over things like headlights and windscreen wipers. There's literally no need for any of this, but it's all there. Even more impressively, the game works on a schedule with weather changes and times affecting what York can and can't do. Spying on people's houses allows you to witness daily routines, shops open and close at specific times, and clues to the investigation can even be found hidden away inside the game's world, even before they become plot important. The sheer level of detail makes it clear that this is no half-hearted rush job made for a quick buck. This is a game with heart and dedication, but without the resources to make it truly polished. Sweary cared about this game, and that makes me care for it too. Oh, and the town map is shaped like a dog, so there's that too. Another endearingly terrible aspect of Deadly Premonition that stands out is its soundtrack. Equally as budget as the rest of the game, the entire score is contained in about four tracks that play endlessly on a loop. The most obvious example is Life is Beautiful, a relaxing acoustic guitar piece that plays during everyday interactions with the townsfolk. And you'll get used to it because it plays in every interaction with the townsfolk. You'll hear that guitar and that whistling constantly, just like you would have done in this video. But it's okay, because this track is catchy as hell. Partly because it sounds like a slowed down acoustic cover of Super Mario World's Overworld theme. It does get a little annoying having it play constantly, and sometimes significantly louder than everything else in the scene, but eventually you become attached to it. It's hypnotic. Isn't that right, Zach? The weird sound mixing is only a fraction of Deadly Premonition's budget nature. The animations aren't the best, with some repeating at every given opportunity, particularly York's weird soup tapping motion he does all the time. The facial animations are usually awful, with York's uh, <laughs> beautiful smile being perfectly fine and not horrifying at all. <laughs> The game also doesn't run all that great, outside the frame rate is often quite sketchy and the car handling can be a little bit awful. Combat is also quite clunky, feeling like Resident Evil 4 but without Capcom's polish. And it should be noted that I played the director's cut on PS3, which was supposed to, you know, improve on stuff like this, but it didn't. Oh, and then there are these squirrels who are apparently are monkeys in disguise. And you know what? All of this is fine. It gives everything a unique B-movie charm, because while these budget constraints have resulted in technical problems, the heart I mentioned two points ago holds it all together. Plus, just like how Twin Peaks had an aesthetic that felt 10 years older than its contemporaries and naively out of date for effect, this jankiness helps bring that to Deadly Premonition 2 by making it feel like you're playing an early PS2 game. The jankiness helps to enhance the weirdness and the creepiness, as opposed to ruining either. And yes, Deadly Premonition is genuinely creepy. The supernatural elements of the story are never fully explained, and in the specific combat sections, the zombie creatures you face off against are some of the most unnerving zombie designs around. They're bent over backwards with mouths slashed open with a gaping void inside. As they attack, they moan endlessly about not wanting to die. <laughs> 
and if they grab hold of York, they will try and force themselves inside him or something? They're disturbing, never truly explained, and may or may not be real. Add this to the disturbing nature of the murders within the game's story, where the victims are killed in many gruesome ways, the disturbing behaviour exhibited by some characters, and finally the fact that nighttime causes many things to come out of the woodwork. Deadly Premonition has a goofy exterior, but hides a truly sinister underbelly that grabs you harder because the Sinner Sandwich discussion or the silly junkyard puzzles have disarmed you. Deadly Premonition is a game with a lot of genuine problems, but it's also one that does the best it can with its budget limitations, has genuine creative love behind it, and the problems end up working in its favour. There are more than enough movies out there made so poorly and ineptly that you can't help but love them, but it's rare for this to happen within games. Deadly Premonition nails it, and became a cult classic in the way that midnight screenings of The Room became popular. There's just something really endearing about a creative work that is rough around the edges, but has a real heart to it, as opposed to the really polished and yet generally quite soulless AAA experiences we're often seeing. And I'd like to see more games like Deadly Premonition, a game that is so bad that it looped right around to being rad again. Thanks for watching, and especially thanks to these supporters over on Patreon. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want more of me talking about weird government agents investigating the supernatural, I also have a video on Control you might enjoy. And you can also check out why other games are rad and bad in this playlist. All the links are in the description, and I'll see you again soon. Bye!